Hello, hello. Welcome to another episode of History in the Dark. I am your host, Darkness the Curse. And before we begin, as always, thank you so much to my generous patrons, my British Rail critics, and of course, my underwater train finders. You are the reason why this content remains! And today, we are going to discuss, well, you guys ever seen Jaws? I actually love that movie. I think a lot of people do. It's a classic. Do you remember Quint and his story about his time on the USS Indianapolis during World War II? Well, that wasn't made up for the movie. That story is actually totally true. Quint probably told it with a lot more eloquence than I am able to muster, but I still think it's important for me, as a procurer of historical facts, to tell you the true story of what happened to the USS Indianapolis. USS Indianapolis, whose nickname was Indy, was one of two Portland-class heavy cruisers built for the United States Navy. Originally, she was designed to be a light cruiser due to her minimal armor, but her heavy 8-inch guns made it so that she should be classified as a heavy cruiser. She was laid down on 31st of March, 1930, launched on the 7th of November, 1931, and officially commissioned on the 15th of November, 1932. Indy was a good ship for her time. Fast, powerful, and when World War II broke out, she was sent on many missions in the Pacific Theater. She wound up shooting down multiple Japanese aircraft in her day, as well as participating in the shelling of various island encampments. She saw continued success in this until March of 1945, when she was struck by a bomb dropped by a Nakajima Kai-43, which the Allies called Oscar. The bomb actually wound up plunging through the Indianapolis before it exploded. Had it detonated inside of her, the damage would have been extensive, but as a result, the damage to the Indianapolis was notable, but she was still able to steam under her own power back to the Mare Island Naval Shipyard for repairs. Once these repairs were complete in July, she was tasked with a very secret mission. Indy and her crew were instructed to carry a very specific type of cargo to Tinian Island. Some sources, and Quint for that matter, say that she was carrying the A-bomb, Little Boy which would be dropped on Hiroshima just a few weeks after this event. But that's not strictly true. She was carrying many of the vital components for Little Boy, though, including the enriched uranium, which at the time was actually about half the world's supply of uranium-235. Obviously, Little Boy needed these components to function as a weapon of unspeakable devastation, and the mission was insanely hush-hush. Indy headed back to San Francisco's Hunter's Point Naval Shipyard. Upon receiving the cargo, she left on the 16th of July, 1945. This was only a few hours after the Trinity test that showed that the bomb worked. Apparently, she actually wound up setting a speed record of 74 and a half hours on her way from San Francisco to Pearl Harbor. She only stopped briefly at Pearl and then headed out into the rest of the Pacific alone succeeding in delivering the atomic bomb components to Tinian on the 26th of July. After that, she was sent back to Guam, and some of her crew were actually relieved by other sailors. She left Guam on the 28th of July, and she began sailing towards light. Then came the 30th of July, 1945, at approximately 0015 hours. The Indianapolis, still all alone out in the Pacific, was spotted by a Japanese submarine, I-58. It was captained by Commander Machisora Hashimoto. Indy was struck on her starboard side by two Type 95 torpedoes. One hit the bow, and one hit amidships. Both hits would have been considered good by the I-58. The explosions had torn through the Indianapolis, causing her massive damage, and she took on a very heavy list. She settled by the bow, and 12 minutes after she was hit, she rolled completely over. Her stern rose into the air, and she sank. Of the 1,195 crewmen aboard, 300 went down with her. The rest of them, however, were left adrift. And that's when, I'll warn you right now, a complete horror show begins. I mean, imagine it. You're left in the middle of the largest ocean in the world. Many of the crew, and possibly you, don't even have life jackets, and there are very few lifeboats. The water is deep, dark, and you can't see anything. During the day, the sun beats down on your face. There's no shade. During the night, it gets frigidly cold. 
and you shiver. And then, after about a day of that, something bumps your leg under the water. You aren't sure what it is, but it feels like it's moving. It's alive. Oh yes, see, during the nearly four days that the survivors were left drifting in the Pacific Ocean, a group of sharks appeared. Now, it's important to recognize that sharks generally don't attack people. They don't really see us as food. There are, of course, exceptions, and this is one of them, but the sharks have been drawn due to the smell of blood from the injured, as well as just the sheer chaos of what was going on in the ocean. It's believed they were probably oceanic white-tip sharks, but it's also been theorized it could have been tiger sharks, a species that's actually very well known as being a bit more aggressive towards attacking humans. The thing about sharks is that they only have a few ways of investigating things they don't understand. And if they don't recognize the whole bunch of these weird animals and their water, well, they're going to do the one thing they know will tell them what it is. They'll bite. That's right, sharks generally investigate things by just biting it. It's been a very effective method for them for billions of years. Now, the problem with this is that whether a shark intends to eat us or not, if they bite us, especially in the kind of situation the crew of the Indianapolis were in, they're going to die. A shark bite will bleed like crazy, and you may lose a limb and many of the sailors died in this manner. Estimations regarding how many of them died of the sharks vary heavily, but most agree it actually wasn't that many in the grand scheme of things. It may have been only a few dozen that genuinely died to sharks. It could also have been as high as 150. But the sailors knew the sharks were there and began making noise and attempting to scare them off. The sharks only tended to pull away the dead after that. Most of the men wound up dying of exposure, dehydration, hypernatremia, hypothermia at night, or just sheer exhaustion. Some were said to have simply killed themselves, unwilling to deal with the torturous conditions further. Of the 900 men that survived the initial sinking of the Indianapolis, only 316 would wind up being rescued. Two of them, Robert Lee Shipman and Frederick Harrison, died the following month. And the truth was the reason they weren't rescued sooner was that the Navy didn't know that the Indianapolis had been sunk. The first time anyone knew that something terrible had happened was by chance. A PBY 5A Catalina patrol plane that was piloted by Lieutenant Commander Robert Adrian Marks spotted the crew as he happened to be passing by. He dropped life rafts, although one was destroyed by the drop, and the others were too far away from the exhausted crew members to actually get to them. The Catalina was an amphibious plane, so it can land in the water, but there were standing orders for these planes not to land in the open ocean. Marx took a vote with his crew to decide whether they should just ignore those orders, and they wound up landing in the ocean anyway, in 12-foot swells, no less. His plane was large enough that he was able to pick up 56 survivors, but he would not be able to take off again with that many people. On top of that, he ordered that parachute cord be used to lash men to the wings of the plane to give them some much-needed relief. This wound up making his plane unflyable, but Marx and his crew were able to render aid as best they could, as well as call in for a proper rescue ship. The destroyer escort, USS Cecil J. Doyle, was the first to arrive on the scene. She used her searchlight as a beacon, and she was followed by six other ships that picked up all the remaining survivors. Mark's plane was not able to get up to speed again, and it was sunk by the Cecil J. Doyle, since there was no way to recover it. But why in the heck did the Navy not know the Indianapolis went down? If you go by Quint's tale, it's because the mission had been so secret that no distress beacon had been sent. But this actually wasn't true at all. Remember, their mission was actually complete by that point. They'd already dropped off the parts for the bomb, and they had just been in Guam. Well, the investigation showed a large number of hiccups regarding the U.S. Navy's, uh, shall we say, personnel at the time. The headquarters of Commander Marianas on Guam and of the Commander Philippine Sea Frontier on Light, both kept operations plotting boards, on which the positions of all vessels were shown where each headquarters would be concerned. It was assumed that ships as large as the Indianapolis would reach their destinations on time unless reported otherwise. As a result, their positions were based on predictions and not on reports. On the 31st of July, when the Indy should have arrived on light, she was removed from the board in the headquarters of Commander Marianas. She was also recorded as having arrived at light by the headquarters of Commander Philippine Sea Frontier. 
despite no one actually confirming if that was the case. Lieutenant Stewart B. Gibson, the operations officer who was under the port director, was responsible for tracking the movements of Indy. The vessel's failure to arrive was known to Gibson, but he failed to investigate the matter and made no immediate report of the fact to his superiors. He just didn't. He received a letter of reprimand in connection to this, in the very first official statement regarding the Indy by the Navy, they said that the distress calls were keyed by radio operators and possibly were actually transmitted, but that no evidence has been developed that any distress message from the ship was received by any ship, aircraft, or shore station. This was a total lie. Declassified records later showed that at least three stations received the signals, but not a single one acted upon it. The reasons actually vary between the stations. One commander was drunk, so that was great, thank you for that. Another had ordered his men not to disturb him, which, I'm sorry, I didn't know you were allowed to just decide not to do your job today. And a third overthought it and decided it must be a Japanese trap. And at least he was actually working. The other two, like seriously, drunk and just don't feel like working today? Are you guys kidding me? As a direct reaction to the loss of the Indianapolis, the Navy created what's known as the Movement Report System, or MOVREP. It's a system that makes available to certain commands vital information on the status, location, and movement of flag commands, commissioned fleet units, and ships under the operational control of the U.S. Navy. It was specifically created to prevent this exact thing from ever happening again. Also, one of the survivors, this is where things get real good, was the captain of the Indianapolis, Charles B. McVeigh III. Though he was one of the last to actually abandon the Indy, he was among the survivors. In November of 1945, he was court-martialed on two charges, failing to order his men to abandon ship and hazarding the ship. The first charge actually fell flat pretty quickly. The other survivors came forward and said, no, 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 he totally ordered us to abandon ship. So he was cleared of that charge but he was not cleared of the hazarding charge. He was believed that he hazarded the Indianapolis by failing to zigzag. Zigzagging is a technique where a ship will, quite literally, zigzag towards a point. They won't go in a straight line, they'll go back and forth in relation to a relative center direction towards where they're actually supposed to be going. The reason they do this is specifically to make it harder for submarines to strike them. Although it's not a perfect technique, the Navy decided that because McVeigh had not actually ordered the Indianapolis to zigzag at that time, the sinking was at least partially his fault. But how true was that? See, his orders were not specifically to zigzag at all times. The Navy's orders to McVeigh were zigzag at his discretion, weather permitting. And McVeigh was not informed that a Japanese submarine was operating in the vicinity of his route, even though the Navy knew that there might be a sub out there. And then since this was all taking place after the war had ended, the commander of I-58, Machitsura Hashimoto, who had survived the war, was actually called to testify. And Hashimoto, I gotta give it to him, totally went up the bat for McVeigh. He insisted that zigzagging in this situation would have made no difference. From his angle of attack, he would have sunk the Indianapolis no matter what. But this didn't matter. McVeigh wound up being convicted, although his sentence was remitted by Fleet Admiral Chester Nimitz himself, and he was restored to active duty. He would wind up retiring in 1949 as a rear admiral, but the loss of the Indianapolis never really left him. For one thing, while the survivors never blamed their captain for the sinking, the families of some of the men who died were a different story. McVeigh received horribly cruel hate mail for many years after the war. One read, Merry Christmas! Our family's holiday would be a lot merrier if you hadn't killed my son. It's like mean YouTube comments before YouTube was a thing. Go figure. Except that it really wasn't McVeigh's fault. But as a result of all this, the court-martialing, the hate mail, and just the fact that the sheer scale of the loss of the ship he was in charge of, and most of the crew on board, must have taken a toll on his mental health, he would sadly wind up committing suicide in 1968. He was discovered on his front lawn by his gardener, with a toy sailor in one hand, and his Navy-issued revolver in the other. He was 70 years old at the time. McVeigh's record would eventually be cleared, 
A sixth grade student by the name of Hunter Scott was doing research for a history project in 1996. His efforts kind of ballooned into a much bigger deal, creating national publicity and got the attention of retired congressional lobbyist Michael Maroney. Maroney had actually been scheduled to be on the Indianapolis before she left Guam on the voyage where she was sunk, but he wound up never being aboard, likely saving his life. At that same time, Captain William J. Toady of the United States Navy, who was the final commanding officer of the fast attack nuclear submarine, also named USS Indianapolis, received an appeal from several of the cruiser's survivors to assist with the exoneration effort of their late captain. Toady himself would demonstrate through analysis that zigzagging would not have spared the Indianapolis from at least one torpedo hit. This got the attention of several senators, and eventually it wound up in front of Congress by October in 2000, who passed a resolution that Captain McVeigh's record should state that he is exonerated for the loss of the Indianapolis. Then President Bill Clinton also signed this resolution. It also went on to point out that even though several hundred ships of the U.S. Navy were lost in combat during World War II, McVeigh was the only captain to be court-martialed for the sinking of his ship. And finally, in July of 2001, the United States Secretary of the Navy, Gordon England, directed Captain Tony to enter the congressional language into McVeigh's official Navy service record, clearing him of all wrongdoing regarding the loss of the Indy. And as for the Indy, well, there were plenty of expeditions to set out looking for her, but no one was exactly sure where she was precisely. However, on the 19th of August, 2017, the Indy was finally discovered by Paul Allen. Yes, the dude who co-founded Microsoft with Bill Gates, that Paul Allen. USS Indianapolis Project. The remains of the Indy were found at a depth of 18,000 feet, or 5,500 meters. This was revealed to the public on the 13th of September, 2017, and she's considered to be very well preserved due to the depth she's at. The water's very cold down there. It's bittersweet to locate her, though, considering the tremendous loss that was suffered as a result of just multiple failures among Navy brass. Had the distress beacon been heard, or the dude responsible for keeping track of whether ships showed up where they were supposed to actually done their job, maybe more would have survived. But sadly, that's not the case. But at least the survivors can rest easy, knowing that the ship has been located, and their captain, who was wrongfully blamed for her loss, is finally exonerated. And with that, a special thank you to all my underwater train finders. Thomas Ward, Lord Captain Von Thrust III, Some Dude 267, Brightline Blue, Joshua Long, Ohio Trucker 1, Royal Hudson 2860, Lord Hoth 444, Arthur Roy, Benjamin Owens, Panzer Kitsun 131-232, Mr. Black Rose Tribal Typhoon, Master of None, Josh Johnson, and Lock Kraken. Till next time. This is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.